Hi, this is Sarah Mancall, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm the Policy Director for the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the first in our five-part webinar series on decolonial approaches to the psychological study of social issues. Um, before we get started today, I want to remind you that today's webinar is being recorded and we will be posting it to SPICI's YouTube channel afterward. So if you go to uh, www.youtube.com backslash SPICI, you can find today's webinar in about 48 hours, along with all the future webinars that will be in this series. And all of the invitations to our future webinars will be coming out on SPICI's email blasts, as well as on our Twitter page and our Facebook page. Now, to get today's webinar started, we have our convener and discussant, Kupano Ratele. He's from Stellenbach University, and he is a professor of psychology. So I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Am I audible? Yes. OK, fantastic. So welcome you all, and thank you again, Sarah. Um, to our panelists and to my colleagues who I will introduce in a short while. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. I wanna show you a few slides. Um, they will be repeating some of the things that Sarah was talking about, um, but we want to share and give our thanks as well to all of you and um, just to introduce the, the webinar. Um, to all of you, as you know, this is um, a webinar entitled Decolonial Perspectives on the Psychological Study of Social Issues. <clears throat> and it is, as Sarah was saying, um, hosted by the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues. And today's one is one in five, the first of five webinars. And today's one is entitled The Psychology of Colonial Violence, Number One, Bodies and Space. And there will be four more. And the first one, the next one, early October, about probably the, the 5th of October, or thereabout, and it'll be the second on the psychology of violence. We will have, uh, we will concentrate on the coloniality of modern progress. And then number three will, and four and five will be a coloniality of knowledge in hegemonic psychology. The first of three will be rigor or rigor motis, followed by confronting professional discipline um, in November, mid-November. And then the last of the five will be on this concept that most of you would have come across, refusal as well as epistemic disobedience in early December. <clears throat> and as part of my thanks to you all um, who have attended, I also want to extend our um, thank yous and gratitude to um, some people here. Um, as you will know, the presentations you will hear today, you might know this, are based on contributions to uh, two special issues of the Journal of Social Issues devoted to decoloniality, coloniality in psychology. And this is edited by my colleagues, and I'm going to ask them. If you can see them, I'm going to ask them to switch on their um, video so you can see them. They, we call ourselves the Resura Decolonial Editorial Collective. I can't see you, but I'm sure you were there. Glenn, Shanaz, and, and Gita. I'm going to return to you. Please keep your, your videos on. I am very happy, we are very happy that we um, have had uh, Wiley, Specie and the JSI to give free access to, I saw it coming in a short while ago on my computer again, 
free access to the articles. And Glenn, you might, Glenn, Shanaz, Gita, correct me if I'm wrong, and Sarah, that this is for the duration of the series, correct? Yes, so yes. thank you for that. Please let others know. Uh, and for, for all of this, we want to thank the editors, in particular, the current editor, Martin Ruck, and Kerry Ryan, who was uh, the previous editor and supportive throughout this, uh, is a two year journey, more than two years of, of doing, of, of meeting every Thursday as a group and, and Sarah who, have, who has put, uh, helped us put this webinar together. And so here is the group again, uh, and I will say a few things about uh, these folk here. Shanaz Safla, um, at the University of South Africa, um, with a shared affiliation at the South African Medical Research Council, if I'm correct. Glenn Adams, um, most of this, all of all of these people you'll have uh, encountered, some of you will have encountered them through emails. Kansas University uh, in the US, Gita Reddy, now at the Open University, and myself at Stellenbosch University. We uh, came together uh, just before around 2018 and the first um, major event that led to, to the special issues was a conference in 2019, February at the University of the Western Cape. We collaborated with a number of people who are not here, who might be in the audience, but are, are, are not part of the editorial collective. Uh, Garth Stevens at the University of the Vedvatrasan, Vets University, Norman Duncan, was also part of that. Umesh Bawa was a, a third a person, a director of international relations at the University of the Western Cape. We collaborated in addition to SPECI, uh, APA SPECI, with the University of the Western Cape, the University of Pretoria, and um, if I'm forgetting other, other partners, I, I beg your pardon, and then a number of us. Um, and this comes out of course of uh, the efforts, our individual efforts as people interested in, in, in decolonial work in the decolonial turn um, and and some of the groupings we have been involved involved with. So today's webinar, the psychology of colonial violence, we have three presentations. The first uh, presentation and, and I'm and I'm supposing that we will have the presentation in this in this order, but if if um, Melissa and Erica and Joanna, Johanna and Anjali want to switch places, I'm happy for you to do this. Please feel free to let me know. Um, and I'm going to introduce them shortly. Um, and I suspect I'm not going to do service to all of who they are. Um, and the first paper will be fighting for our sisters, community advocacy and action for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, it'll be by Melissa T and Erica Ficklin. And I'm going to ask them to introduce um, their um, co-authors, Johanna Lukate. Um, but perhaps I should also go ahead because I don't want to take too much time so that no, I'm going to do this, if you allow me. I'm going to uh, want to do service justice by introducing the, the speakers. Melissa Tay is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. She's an associate professor at Utah State University in the Department of Psychology, director of the American Indian Support Project, an assistant director of the Mentoring and Encouraging Student Academic Success Program, for Native American students at Utah State University. Dr. Tihi's clinical and research interests are in addressing trauma across the lifespan. Her research is focused on domestic violence and other trauma experienced by ethnic and racial minorities, especially American Indians. Her other research interests include multicultural competence and mentoring ethnic minority students in higher education. She earned dual degrees in clinical psychology, policy and law, PhD, JD, with a certificate in indigenous people's law and policy at the University of Arizona. Dr. Tihi has a master 
of Science in Psychology from Western Washington University and a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from the University of Nebraska. I am hoping that I'm still on because South Africa has been suffering blackouts um, that you still can hear me. Erica Figlin is a proud member of the, and I beg your pardon if I mispronounce this, Klingit and Onglala Lakota tribes. She's currently in the combined clinical and counseling psychology program at Utah State University and mentored by Melissa Tihi. Erica is passionate about advocating for native communities and mental health. Her goal is to dedicate a career to community advocacy and research to improve the holistic well being of native communities. Erica and Melissa will be presenting on the article I referred to. In the article, the article, they write that we are bringing indigenous knowledge and activism to the attention of the academic, Western academic world by infiltrating the colonial structures that currently dictate what information is valid. I'm looking forward to this. I hope, um, um, I'm sure many of you will be, um, would like to hear what they have to say about, but the article, as I said, is open. And I'm going to ask Melissa or Erica at the beginning of her presentation to introduce her co-authors who have recorded the video, which Melissa will show, and the co-authors, uh, so we'll mention the co-authors. Um, let me go to Anjali next. Anjali Dat is an associate professor of social community psychology at the University of Cincinnati in the Community and Organizational Research for Action program. She earned her BA at the College of New Jersey, an MA and PhD in psychology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her research focuses on psychological processes that are associated with resistance to oppression and increasing the realization of human rights, particularly in the context of globalization. She collaborates with local organization and you will see this in the paper she will present to conduct mixed methods and being of marginalized communities. She's particularly passionate about topics related to migration and social justice. Anjali will present the paper, Refugee Experiences in Cincinnati, Ohio, a local case study in the context of global crisis that I mentioned, co-authored with Farah Jacques, Autumn Kekendal, Brian Wright, and Riham Alwan, in which they apply a decolonial approach to explore how colonial histories shape the experiences of refugees living in the United States. The work is an outcome of an ongoing community-based participatory research by the Civic Action for Refugee Empowerment in Cincinnati Care Cincinnati, the community-based participatory research team comprising of 12 refugee members from seven different countries who reside in the greater Cincinnati community, two university-based researchers and a representative of the city government focused on immigrant welcome initiatives. I want to do all of this so that when the speakers start, they they just we just roll on uh, until we get we get to the questions and then and the discussions later. Johanna Lucate is a researcher in the Department of Sociocultural Diversity at the Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity in Göttingen, Germany. Johanna received a PhD in psychology from the University of Cambridge, the United Kingdom, where she worked on black and mixed race women's identities as expressed in and through her textures and styles and examined how the natural hair movement was changing social representations of black hair. Johanna is broadly interested in how bodies, social norms, social cultural context and physical environments work to shape how individual make sense of who they are and in turn how they're experienced, perceived by others, depending on the context they're in. Currently, she's focused on Black and African multiplicities in the context of migration to Europe. In her article, Space, Race and Identity, an Ethnographic Study of the Black Hair Care and Beauty Landscape and Black Women's Racial Identity Construction in England, Johanna asks this question. How are Black women's racial identities constructed, structured, and shaped by and through their interactions with and navigation of the Black hair care and beauty landscape in England? Among the 
three major points she draws out is that black women's racial identity formation takes place within and against confrontations with the dominant standards of beauty, which are white. I am going to ask the panelists then to tell us whether Melissa and Erica will start or Anjali or Johanna, who's going to start? We're we're ready to start. We'd be glad to. Go ahead. All right. Um, welcome everyone. We are presenting. We pre-recorded. Um, so you'll see Erica has uh, a tiny a tiny gift with her that that may interrupt. Um, so we pre-recorded with everybody. Our co-authors, um, Devin Isaacs and Sally Mack, both started um, internship uh, a few weeks ago, and so they were unable to, to take time off to join today. So we, we were able to sort of put together a, a video for you all that we will share. Thank you all for joining us for our presentation titled Fighting for Our Sisters, Community Advocacy and Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. As a lab, we have been working to bring light to the atrocities faced by Indigenous women and girls. While we hope this work spreads awareness of the issues, we are also hoping to show the strengths and resilience of Indigenous women and their communities. In this presentation, Rachel Kilgore will deliver a brief history of violence towards Indigenous women. Erica Ficklin will speak on the importance of the language used when discussing this topic. And Devin Isaacs will share her work with young women from her community who are advocating for change and working to heal trauma across generations. I'd like to start with providing a little background information on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, or MMIWG for short. Indigenous women in North America are 4.5 times more likely to be victims of violence than the general population. In the United States, where we work, four in five Indigenous women will experience violence in their lifetime, and over half of Indigenous women will have experienced sexual violence. To note, a majority of this violence against Indigenous women is interracial, such that it is perpetrated by non-Native individuals. The statistics behind the issues are shocking, and we hope that this presentation provides more information to give light to the issue and also to give voice to the women, girls, and communities affected. Thank you for being here. There's a traditional Cheyenne saying which says, a nation is not conquered until the hearts of its women are on the ground then it is done, no matter how brave its warriors, nor how strong its weapons. This is something that is very well understood in history, and we can see this war tool in effect. If we take a look back at history, the U.S. government viewed the presence of American Indians as the Indian problem, and American Indians were quite often blamed for the suffering inflicted upon them. They experienced astonishing losses and violence, religious persecution, harmful stereotypes were perpetrated, dangerous, dangerous governmental policies were put forth, forced sterilization, boarding schools that sought to eradicate the culture, the language, and the values of tribal nations. And there were many more examples of eradication and assimilation efforts, sometimes depending on what part of the historical timeline that we look at. Native women were also experiencing sexual violence and to quote Smith and Ross, it is through these constant assaults that colonizers have attempted to eradicate their sense of identity. Sexual violence then and now is an attack on both the body and the mind. It is directly um, targeting a Native women's sense of identity. And when this violence happens, and when it happens today, it's followed by the blaming of Native peoples, the blaming of Native women for the violence done to her. It also leads to untruths. These false beliefs that Native women are rapeable and depicting her in dehumanized ways. 
The stereotypes and beliefs of Native women have historically conformed to public perceptions and attitudes that were rooted in colonization. Effective genocidal tools used by those who drove colonial efforts included sexual violence on Native bodies, and then cultural representations of violence were another way that colonialism controlled and presently attempts to control Native identities and culture. But Native women's incredible resilience as the bearers of life and matriarchs continue to pass on traditions of her people. This is resistance, and resistance occurs in many forms, such as holding on to traditional values, speaking and passing on the language, and organized Native community efforts that not only brings attention to the violence she endures, but also to her preciousness and her sacredness. Hi, my name is Erica Ficklin, and I'm a proud member of the Tlingit and Oglala Lakota tribes. One thing that I wanted to share with you is how important it is that we look into the language that describes how we talk about the violence committed against missing and murdered Indigenous women. A lot of times there is a lot of language that is very victim blaming and goes into discussing how the women and girls were responsible for the actions and the violence committed against them. Victim blaming is never okay, and it is horrible how common it is within the MyWG. So, oh, some of the things that are commonly discussed are in the media are whether or not the women were hitchhiking, what they were wearing, you know, kind of the kinds of areas that they were in, uh, who they were with whether or not they should have known that that person could potentially be violent. Um, anyway, it is a long and painful story and it is something that is just perpetuated whenever uh, people are saying that these people are responsible for getting into situations that ended up with their lives being taken from them, from their voices being silenced. It's not something that we should be talking about in any way that's disrespectful. Every spirit deserves respect. And we need to be mindful about how we're talking about these cases. You know, another thing about victim blaming is that it distances you from the women and their families so that there's less empathy whenever we're considering the acts that are committed against um, MMIWG. So whenever, you know, it's a lot easier to brush something off as like, oh, well, that was that person's fault, or they got into a situation that they shouldn't have, and to pretend that something like this is preventable, which is just the only per person who's able to prevent the violence is the one who's perpetrating it. The women and the, all the victims that have accumulated over the centuries since the beginning of colonization, it's not okay, and it's not their fault. And it's not our fault as Indigenous women. No one deserves violence. No one deserves to be murdered or have these acts committed against them. And that's why I think it is so incredibly important that we treat women with respect, especially in these key and painful stories about MMIWG. Tanashchish. The first time that I was asked to speak about our stolen sisters, about missing and murdered Indigenous women, uh, was several years ago during a women's march, and someone approached me and said, we want you to speak on a topic relevant to Native women. And of course, I immediately thought about missing or murdered Indigenous women. This was a difficult topic for me. It was something that I had definitely done work in and had thought about, but didn't really fully realize the impact of in my own community as part of that work, I went back and collected stories from community members and found that all too often we all knew someone who had been taken, who was missing or had been identified as murdered. And so I started to realize that I grew up in a community where there was a lot of risk. And this was a difficult thing to think about for me. 
as a kid, you, you go off and you have fun, you hang out with friends and you don't realize the risk that is out there. But I also didn't want to live in fear. In these last few months, I had a chance to come full circle and work with some students from my high school who were doing a podcast on missing or murdered Indigenous women in their community. And they spoke so eloquently about two particular women that we all knew and had heard of in our community that had never been found. The same type of fear arose for these young girls when they realized that there was risk involved in just being Indigenous. But they found that when they, they talked to their mothers about their work, their mothers also knew so many people who had been taken and those women had been encouraged not to speak out. In talking to their mothers, there was a sense of generational healing and awareness raising and empowerment to speak up and speak out about what they had experienced. These young girls are absolutely amazing and I've had a chance to go on and, and do other amazing work. They, they have had poetry published, they have had artwork recognized, they, they actually submitted their podcast to National Public Radio. Many of them will be going off on their own journeys towards higher education or careers, to raising families, to having their own daughters. The work that they did and the support that they received for that work will help them not have to live in fear any longer. They have found their voices, they're attending to community healing, and they give us all a lot of hope. And I think that it's hard to hear these stories and to know the tragedies that come within these families and communities. But I think the thing that we need most now is hope. Thank you all. We will have time for questions and we have more details about some of the community advocacy um, and action that has been taken in the article itself. We can't hear you that now. Well, thanks for that. So thank you once again. Um, thank you to, to you and Devon Isaacs and Rachel Kilgo and uh, Erica Ficklin and all of your sisters and, and co-authors. Um, I propose, Joan, I see you. Joan, I see you are getting ready there. But I propose if anybody wants to ask a question, one or two questions for now, before we move on. And I'm going to ask my comrades, my partners, co-editors to help me if I'm missing any question. Any questions, any comments? Okay, we will double back at the end and, and have discussions and questions. Johanna, are you ready? Okay. Yes, I can just share my screen. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, so first of all, thank you for um, not just putting together these two amazing special issues, but for inviting us into your community and um, making this event happen today. My papers entitled Space, Race and Identity, but in thinking about um, today's webinar and 
what I could like, offer in terms of talking about my paper, I've decided to focus on space, bodies and identity. And I, I hope it becomes clear in a couple of moments why I think that shift is fruitful. And I hope you can hear me all right. Um, yes, we can. So just to give, thank you. So just to give you a short overview, um, rather than to rehash my paper, I wanted to talk you through um, a bit through my research process and how that led to the writing and theorizing of space, race, and identity. Um, and so I'm going to talk about each of those elements a little bit: the body, um, the space, and identity. And I'm going to raise three questions for working with and on space, bodies, and identity, which I think can be quite useful for all of us to think about. And I hope that we can have a bit of a dialogue about those questions later on. Now, the first question I want to pose is, what is the place of the body and the corporal in social psychological research, thinking and theorizing past, present and future? And it's really a question that has been with me since my undergraduate days, when I often had this feeling that all the theories and concepts I was encountering were very much focused on the mind and on emotions, and but on, on humans that seem to be without a body. Um, so yeah, it's as, if we, as if we are suspended um, somehow from space <laughs> and from the physical environment that we're in. And so in, in many ways, I think that my PhD project on which this, this paper is also based in part um, was kind of like doing the reverse. And it really started with the body because I centered on black hair and black and mixed race women in England and Germany. And for me, black hair was really kind of like an interesting avenue into thinking a lot of, about a lot of questions of how black and mixed race women's identities are shaped both in the past, um, but also in the present. And so bringing into some of the kind of like more historical ways in which black hair has been perceived and um, how it is, as Copano earlier outlined, um, how it is constructed against and within dominant standards of beauty, which do not see black hair as the epitome of beauty, but rather the opposite of it. Um, but at the same time, I was looking at the natural hair movement, which really very much was kind of like trying to fight against those standards and, and was embracing natural black hair. Um, and so I think that was an, an interesting time. Um, but as I said, I was not just looking at, at the body, I also became interested in space, which brings me to my second question, um, which is how can social psychological research thinking and theorizing account for the role of space and places in humans making sense of who they are? And so this brings me a bit closer to the research process that um, underpinned my PhD project. And basically the, the paper is, the subtitle of my paper is an ethnographic study of black hair care and beauty, of the black hair care and beauty landscape and black women's racial identity constructions in England. And so I want to invite you here to retrace a little bit the, the first, very first steps I took as an ethnographer um, when, I, when I started this research. And, and in these days and times, um, what I did, I did not open a book or something to like look up hair saloons, but I typed um, hair saloon into, into Google search. Um, and then that types Afro hair saloon into Google search. And I was really surprised that they, at the results. So you see here on the left hand upper corner, the results for um, search for my search for London Afro hair saloons. And as you can see, it's quite spread out and um, rather far out of the center of London. There's not really any hit for the center of London. Um, but if I search for London hair saloon, so I take out the, the racializing um, marker Afro, I get a lot of hits for the center of London. Um, and so there's a couple of implications in this search. Um, first of all, it, it, is, it visualizes the racialized segregation of hair saloons in the hair care and beauty industry. And I'll talk a little bit later on about how that shaped the identities of, of the women that I talked to in my, in my research. Um, but in many ways, I think it also already says something about how both my own research and they're kind of like going about this research as a human person who has to take certain paths was shaped by um, where those hair saloons are located. And at the same time, what this means for black women looking for hair care that, um, or like hair saloons who can cater to their hair textures and offer hairstyles that they are seeking out. Um, yeah. 
Um, I want to bring in um, this quote from Caroline Knowles, who talks about space as an active archive of the social processes and social relationships composing racial orders. Um, active because it is not just a monument accumulated through a racial past and present, although it is also that, it is active in the sense that it interacts with people and their activities as an ongoing set of possibilities in which race is fabricated. And I think I, I really like this idea of an active archive because that almost brings us also to the process of like thinking about both the coloniality um, of space and then race in terms of like decolonial, decolonizing space. Um, and so really, I think what a lot of these women encountered is, is the coloniality of space and the terms in which um, historic processes of racial segregation also in, in England um, have contributed to the fact that we now find those hair saloons in, in certain um, neighborhoods in London, but not in other ones. So then the third question for me um, is how does centering bodies and space impact social psychological understandings of identity and the self? And I'm going to give you three examples which are also in some ways a teaser. So if you haven't read my paper yet, then maybe they, they will um, get, spark your interest in the paper and I invite you to follow up um, with those um, um, and, and some of my arguments um, by reading the paper. But thinking about what, it, what we learn when we center space, body and identity, one insight for me was um, how it shapes how we navigate the consumer landscape while black. And one woman that I talked to, she talked about how she couldn't understand why we're not catered for. So we, as black women, why are we not catered for? And she couldn't understand little things like how I could walk into Boots, um, how I could walk into Boots and Superdrug and I can't find my mainstream stuff. Now I admit that the photo here is a bit misleading because it actually alludes to another dimension, which is now um, corporate mainstream corporate companies taking up and catering to curly and Afro-textured hair. But I think what she's referring to more is, is this, this like racial segregation of the, the beauty landscape and the beauty industry, meaning that black and mixed race women and those seeking kind of like um, hair care for, for Afro textured hair were usually relegated to ethnic shops um, and where they can buy their products, but they cannot go just out on the main street or the high street and, and go into any store and, and buy their shampoo or something that, that works for their hair. And so in, in many ways that kind of like shapes how they how they see themselves within society, how how they learn about where their place is in society and what other people think about where their place in society should be. Another aspect is this idea of like finding places. Um, and so Abigail talked about how she preserved and plucked up the courage to go all the way to Birmingham to get her hair cut. Um, because that hairdresser was the only one that she saw 100% good reviews and, and so she felt that she should go there and, and get it done. Um, so there's really also a trust issue um, for some of the women. Um, there, there's uh, like the other, the other end of, of basically this, the, this racial segregation of, of hairdressing is that up until recently, hairdressers did not learn how to um, cut with style Afro-textured hair. So you can't just walk into any hair saloon and assume that the people will be able to do your hair. And even if you go to an Afro hair saloon, oftentimes the hairdressers there are not trained or have not followed up on training in, in cutting hair, but instead they're trained to braid hair, to do weaves and wigs. So it's a very different kind of hairstyle that it's offered there, um, but not what Abigail um, was looking for in this case. And so in many ways here, she speaks to the fact that a lot of these women have to travel long distances to get um, the kind of hair care um, that for some other people is a matter of just getting out of the house and walking down 150 meters or something to the next hair saloon. And then the last aspect I want to bring up is um, on how centering space, race, body, space, body and identity, um, what it can tell us about being a black person and then entering a white hair saloon. So Faith here, she talks about how someone at a white hair saloon once told her that they would not be able to do her hair. Um, she had gone to this hair saloon um, to ask to have her hair relaxed, so she wanted it chemically straightened. Um, but in response to her request, the hairdresser said, we don't do your hair. 
And I think she really captures the essence of like how how deeply this affected her um, as a black woman and her her identity and the understanding of who she is within the British society when she says that this experience that it kind of like felt like ruining her whole existence of being a black person and then it made her feel really small. So I want to conclude with some thoughts on the coloniality or racialization of space and the need for decolonial social psychological research and theory. Um, and I really see three um, avenues or ways in which we can do this. One is for me to make sure that we make space for the body and the corporal in our research and in our theories. Um, and that we, that we really allow research participants to, to bring in how their body shapes who they are um, their sense of who they are. Um, second is ex really ac actively exploring the role of space and places in humans making sense of who they are. Um, and then the third aspect for me is, is kind of like centering the impact of bodies in space, place and theorizing identity and the self. So if you noticed like earlier, I had kind of like separated the three points out. And, and I think for me really, um, the what decolon de what the decolonial psychology um, offers is, is this idea of like bringing space, body, and identity together, and realizing that we can't separate them out. That but for, but for many people, um, these three always work together in shaping their sense of who they are. Thank you so much. Thank you, Johanna. I'm navigating two devices, as I say, so that you can hear me clearly. Um, I'm repeating myself, but thank you very much to you uh, again. Um, and we might say this at, the, at towards the end, um, that in grouping this presentations for today, um, the four of us, Glenn Adams, Gita Reddy, and Shanaz Safla, we, we had uh, a number of mappings that we had done and, and Johanna's, Johanna's uh, paper uh, was grouped with, uh, or rather, because it speaks a lot to space, as you see in the introduction to the first installment um, of the special issues. But you can see the ties between what Melissa and, uh, and her colleagues presented and the assaults that begin with her against black women's whole existence, the, shall we say, the symbolic violence, the everydayness of it. Um, and, and, and I am hoping we can have dis more discussions on this. For now, if you have a comment, a question, please, uh, can you just post it or raise your hand? Um, and let's... Uh, have you, Hannah, respond to you? Any questions? Okay. We shall move on uh, to Anjali's paper. Thank you so much. I'll just start sharing my screen as well. Thank you all so much for being here today. It's really an honor to be on a panel with Melissa's team and Johanna. And I'm very grateful to Spissy and the organizers of this special issue for all the work that you've been doing to spread understanding and commitment to decolonial practices. I'll be talking about research that I have been engaged in with a team of really incredible people, all committed to refugee justice in the city where I live, Cincinnati, Ohio, in the United States. I'll be talking more about our research process and the people involved in a moment, but I would be remiss if I didn't start today by noting that this research was truly a team effort. And though I'm the one speaking today, I'm only able to do so because of the phenomenal team that I'm a part of. So of course you all know that we're talking about decolonial theory and psychology today, but I wanted to start by explaining how I'll be using these theories in our discussion of refugee experiences in Cincinnati. In many ways, the notion of taking a decolonial approach to refugee resettlement sounds close to utopian, given how far we are from being able to actualize justice for refugees and forced migrants right now. 
The processes in place are often so negligent of the historical and enduring global inequities and patterns of colonial exploitation that shape the contemporary crisis. In our work, we employ a decolonial lens to psychological analysis by resisting and aiming to make apparent the colonial violence inherent in mainstream processes of knowledge formation and illustrating how systems of domination continually shape perceptions about the value and subjectivity of all people. So in other words, we're seeking to document the coloniality of our world as it relates to refugees and forced migrants. We see manifestations of coloniality in numerous ways, including portrayals and treatment of refugees, and then in ways that host societies are structured, such as in neighborhood segregation, along with ideas about who is viewed as a legitimate researcher. So by examining questions about the experiences of refugees from this standpoint, we aim to contribute to a decolonial understanding of refugee experiences while underscoring that we are incredibly far from where we need to be. So to provide some initial context, there are currently over 90 million displaced people resulting from persecution, human rights violations, violence, or serious disruption to public well-being though only less than a third have received formal refugee status. Although there is a tendency to talk about the contemporary refugee crisis as though it's something that has recently emerged as a result of recent wars and other national and international catastrophes, there are direct links to colonial history and enduring coloniality and how refugees are perceived and treated. The material and psychological outcomes of colonial domination are reflected in the consistent inequitable distribution of resources globally, as well as the perceptions people hold about refugees, asylum seekers, and other displaced communities. These outcomes result in enduring conflicts that necessitate migration, national and international policies that impact the mobility of refugees, and in dehumanizing treatment. So next, I want to talk both about the contemporary and historical context of Cincinnati. So like the majority of cities throughout the United States, Cincinnati, Ohio has a long history of racial segregation that has deep roots in the era of legalized slavery. Although slavery was technically illegal in Ohio since its founding as a state in the US, it's located just north of the Ohio River. It's probably hard to tell, but there is a little red dot <laughs> indicating its location on that map. Um, and this was a boundary that divided slates where slavery was legal from free states prior to the US Civil War. Historians note that cultural similarity and community connections among white individuals on both sides of the Ohio River during this time resulted in the region becoming a borderland where hostility towards African Americans was particularly high. The Great Migration, which occurred after the abolishment of slavery throughout the United States and lasted through the 1970s, was a period where 6 million African Americans fled conditions in the rural South and moved to cities in the North, including Cincinnati. Racial justice activists and scholars, Brian Stevenson and Isabella Wilkerson, explained that African Americans during this time should be understood as refugees seeking to escape the terror of the South who landed in the equivalent of refugee camps in the north, north, where educational, political, and economic disparities abounded. Economic and social disinvestment in these areas has ensued and can be seen in the generational poverty and enduring marginalization of the African American communities in these locations. To this day, Cincinnati is highly segregated along racial lines and nearly 40% of the African American population in Cincinnati lives below the po poverty line compared to just under 20% of the white population. So it's with this context in mind that I'm gonna start talking about the current research project. Though considered a non-traditional immigrant destination city, Cincinnati has a growing refugee population. There are approximately 25,000 refugees in this region, the majority of whom are from Bhutan, the Congo, Eritrea, and Afghanistan. The current study is part of an ongoing collaborative research and action project involving members of local refugee communities, leaders of community organizations that support refugees, and academic researchers. We started working together in October of 2018 by, perform by forming a community-based participatory research team with 12 refugee team members. Our team is incredibly diverse, and we have been very intentional about not portraying refugees as a monolith. You can see more details about our refugee team members on this 
screen and I'd be happy to answer any questions about our process and our team at any point. Our process of working together is guided by CBPR or community based participatory research. This is an approach to research that prioritizes equitable collaboration among partners while combining knowledge and action to produce justice oriented social change. A central aim of this collaboration has been to reject exclusive, exclusive ideas surrounding who can formulate, design, and enact meaningful research. We have several publications and actions that have come out of this work, but when we first began working together, we set out to develop our collective goals. And in our initial meetings together, we decided upon the following. First, since there was so little uh, research available about the experiences of refugees in our area, we wanted to start by just developing a better understanding of what it was like to be a refugee living in this region. We also knew that the refugee communities were very diverse in our area, and so we wanted to collect as diverse representation as possible, and we wanted to get as many voices as possible. We wanted, we wanted to hear from as many people as possible and knew that that might prevent as much depth of understanding at our first pass, but our initial goals were to hear from as many people as possible. And this led us to collaboratively develop a survey. We, um, for those of you who are familiar with survey development in psychology, you might look at some of these survey items and think that this doesn't look like a traditional psychometrically sound scale, and it's certainly not. We wanted to prioritize the questions that were most important to our team members. So we worked together to develop sur survey items. Um, we initially created the work collaboratively in English, and then team members translated it into seven different languages. The survey had 22 items. You could see a few examples here. For each question, people could respond yes, somewhat, no, I don't know, and or no, not answer. And each item followed up with the question of what is the main reason you answer this way? We later did focus groups to get deeper insight into um, the findings that we had in our survey. But the results that I'm going to share today are based on our initial survey. Um, our survey was completed by 291 refugees residing throughout the greater Cincinnati region. It was 50% a female sample, 56% were married. Our median age of completing the survey was 31 with a range of 18 years old to 62. And on average, people had been residing in the U.S. for about seven years and in Cincinnati for about four years. We did a number of different analyses and I could point you to different papers that shared different insights. But what I wanted to talk about today is some analyses that we did that compared the experiences of refugees from African countries to with those who are from non-African countries. And what you can see from, and I'm just gonna emphasize six specific questions, some of which have significant differences in findings and some of which don't. And so the first thing that I wanna highlight is that when we ask the question, when you go to see a doctor or nurse, do you have trouble communicating with them? Refugees from African countries were more likely to say yes, that they had difficulty um, communicating with doctors or nurses. However, if you look at the question just above, there was no significant difference in, in ability to access health care. We found a similar pattern with the question, do you feel good about your job situation or questions related to employment more broadly? Refugees from African countries were more likely to say no, that they did not feel good about their, their job situation. However, again, there were no significant differences in the ability to use education or skills here in this area, meaning that there were probably, there were likely fewer, um, there are similarities and barriers to be able to access um, employment. And then again, the same pattern emerged with this set of questions that had to do about with building community in the region. Um, refugees from African countries were more likely to be dissatisfied with the friendships that they had developed in the area. However, when it came to having access to places to spend time with friends, or in other words, meet people, we didn't see any significant differences. And what was important, and I'll also note that in all of the other questions on our survey, there were no differences between African and non-African refugees. And so what became really important for us to further investigate is why was it that refugees from African countries were having um, this differential treatment, similar access, or similar, which really translates to similar encountering similar barriers, but repeatedly we're seeing um, more negative experiences that had to do with interactions with other people and, and the treatment that people were experiencing. And this led us to want to gain deeper understanding into how can we think about this from a colonial perspective. Um, so it is well documented that 
systemic racism leads to poor healthcare experiences, employment, and housing discrimination and social exclusion that negatively impacts communities of color. Thus, although refugees from every community in our survey reported some challenges on each of these questions, we believe that the specific racial history and enduring disenfranchisement of the Black community in Cincinnati likely exacerbates disadvantages for ref African refugees in this context. In order to foster justice for refugees and forced migrants, we need to consider how colonial history is alive and thriving in all contexts that relate to refugees. Just as a starting point, when it comes to refugee resettlement, we often think about refugee acculturation. We also need to think about the local culture in the area of resettlement and what can be done to address barriers to refugee well-being and racial justice more broadly. And then I want to note that there's no denying that the analyses described in this study utilize logic around racial difference that without care can lead to really essentialist portrayals of refugee communities that contribute to harm. And additionally, one could argue that the use of quantitative measures to assess differences in experiences upon race too closely replicates methods that have been used to divide and marginalize communities, emphasizing difference rather than solidarity. However, it was the solidarity of our team that encouraged us to look at these differences across gr groups and encouraged our um, awareness of the need to look for how our specific communities being disadvantaged despite the similarities of barriers that everyone was experiencing. And then I wanted to end with a quote by Ignacio Martin Barreau, who continues to be um, a person whose work I constantly go to to draw all sorts of inspiration. Uh, Martin Barreau said, psychological knowledge is important insofar as it works or fails to work for dealing with objective realities, contributes or not to the humanization of people, and assists or obstructs the efforts of groups or peoples to take command of their own experience. We know that forced migration will be a defining feature of the 21st century. It always already certainly has been. I'm currently working on a paper with my colleague Oske Savas at Bennington College, and we argue that the first quarter of the century has seen increasing levels of nationalism and insularity associated with hostility towards migrants, rather than prioritizing work and solidarity to develop just and compassionate international processes to support these migrants. And I hope that some of this work inspires a deeper understanding of the realities of both uh, refugees and other forced migrants and the locations where um, refugees and migrants are forced to resettle and, and encourages us to think more deeply about how we can create more just realities for everyone. Thank you. It takes a while to transition between these, so it's a little not so seamless. Thank you, Anjali. Thank you for that presentation. Um, and um, some questions in the chat already. Um, so. Do we have any questions, any comments to the presentation by Anjali? And I am very happy for my comrades, my colleagues and friends and to help me um, here. I always feel that although these webinars are great, that we are not in the same room. Uh, at least in person, always uh, cuts us off from uh, something um, else. Okay. Um, sh let me direct this. I think it might be to you, Anjali. Um, it's from Dennis Nickbor who says, you made the point that quantitative measurement may struggle to capture lived experience. <clears throat> we have used qualitative methods and interview for this purpose. Have you tried this too? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, 
I had we this was the larger study and it's a continuing team. We still work together. Um, we have used both quantitative and qualitative measures. And we initially started by using, we decided collectively that we wanted to capture as many voices as possible. And so that led us to use a, quali a quantitative method to start. So that's how we were had uh, just under 300 people complete it. We didn't think we would be able to get that many voices if we did a longer form qualitative method. Um, but then we collectively put together some initial like reports kind of showing some of the frequencies of answers, some of the patterns that we saw emerging. And then our team members led focus groups and we had we usually have about eight people in each focus group. Um, and so they, and the focus groups were um, divided up by country of origin. And so we had people um, give some more depth of insight into why, why some of the patterns emerged and to, which was incredibly um, insightful. I, I think to be honest, while there's a lot to be gained from the quantitative, it's the, the uniting the two that I think really gave us the deepest understanding. So thanks for that question. I also wanted to know, I saw a previous question I do want to note that um, in our research, you don't act for our study, we don't actually require you to have refugee status. The ability to gain refugee status is extremely politicized. Um, people from specific countries are barred from getting refugee status. Um, and it is it's it has let far less to do with the realities of a person and what they've experienced than it has to do with the geopolitical relationships between countries. And so we did not ask, no one, people who are in our study did not have to have um, refugee status, but rather be fleeing hardship. Um, I, I don't remember exactly how we phrased the word wording, but um, I note that just um, in response to a previous question that asked about like, what it, are, are there differences between the experiences of people who enter with actual refugee status, which is something that is designed by the state, not necessarily a determination that has to do with the person's realities, as opposed to somebody who comes without documentation. Um, because oftentimes the experiences of people are extremely similar and extremely dehumanizing and a result of, of global inequities, we don't require that people have that distinction in our, our project at all. So I just wanted to mention that. But thanks for both of those questions. I'm happy to, I was happy to be able to clarify. Yes. Um, thanks, Anjali. Somebody has asked, um, for the links to papers. So I'm going to ask Sarah to do that again. And I see um, that Johanna um, has posted the profile to links for publications. So if you would do the same, uh, Melissa and uh, Angeli, but uh, for the papers in the special issue, um, <clears throat> would you have the post again in the chat, please? Um, Um, so this was Professor Sarah Agnella. And could the presenters please put into the chat any link to their papers? And as I said, um, Johanna has already done that. Um, I have missed some questions up, up there, so I'm going to... Um, so this... If you will allow me, can we, if there's no other question to Anjali for now, um, I want to move and open this for um, questions to all the um, presenters <clears throat> and, and comments. But I want to make just one or two remarks, by the way, before. Um, okay, I see a question before I get there from Syed Mohammed. Let me just take that, uh, if you can see it. Uh, Anjali says, is there any part of your work which is looking at relationships between various refugee communities, e.g. black and white, black and non-black refugees, between black and non-black refugees, Anjali? Uh, that's a great question. These analyses were between, between black refugees and non-black refugees. But we have, I mean, there's so many, so much more that could be done. And so I appreciate the question because I think there's, um, you know, there are a number of different refugee communities in Cincinnati and they all have very unique histories, um, uh, very different experiences, different political tides that shape the way immigrants are, are, are treated or impact 
in refugee communities as well. So there's a lot more to do, but this is the only analyses that we've done thus far that really compare the experiences of Black refugees versus non-Black refugees. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure about this question, but I'm gonna put it to you um, again from Rakshanda Salim. If one is going to insist on the language of legal versus illegal, it cannot be a term that begins with after my ancestors came over and colonized. I'm not sure if you understand it, but if you do, please uh, respond. Jelly? Um. So if, if we're going to use the word legal versus legal, and I, I very intentionally avoid using that language because I very strongly feel that who is given legal status has far more to do with political relationships between countries as opposed to the realities of people. And it's extremely true that the United States has caused so much of the harm that leads, causes people to flee into where I currently, the country that I currently live in. And so but to call someone illegal for fleeing violence that was created by unjust systems that the U.S. is often implicated in is just completely illogical to me and why I, I regularly don't use the word legal versus illegal. Um, and it also like and to add the layer that you're adding in about thinking about this point of it only matters after after your uh, people are making distinctions based on when their ancestors have arrived, I think is a really, really important one and it really adds this decolonial lens to, to what we need to be thinking about because so often no one knows if their ancestors came in in a way that might be considered or illegal and often in a, um, the the laws that existed at one point in time had to do with exploited economic goals and exploitative economic goals and who we wanted in this country so to have any language around legality dictating how we should perceive the humanity of a group of people um, is, is, I mean, it's alive and well. I think it's extremely common. I think our, our mainstream media increase, uh, encourages it. I think it's hard, it's rare that you encounter narratives that resist it. And yet I think anyone who's committed to decolonial work needs to be a part of, um, of, of circulating a more accurate narrative. So thank you for the question. I, I don't think I do it justice, but I, I hope it's a starting point. I'd need to think about it longer. And I, I would just like to add a little bit to this because I saw some other things in here. Um, but I, and maybe a lot of people here know this, but it is no human is illegal, right? But also the act of being in the United States undocumented is not a criminal violation in any way. So the act of um, entering into the US without inspection is a misdemeanor, right? So is speeding, right? So is walking across the street against the light. Like I'm committing misdemeanors frequently. So that's the level that that rises to. But remaining in the United States is not an ongoing criminal violation, just that one moment, just like crossing a street against the light. So I just want to to put that out there from the the legal perspective as well. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I see where this discussion is going. Uh, the interesting part about this, of course, uh, is precisely about this um, plums questions of colonization and coloniality, um, precisely what we're talking about here. And I had missed a particular part of this interaction, but thank you, Anjali, for your responses and Melissa, because they were fantastic. Um, I, you are receiving, I suppose, because perhaps one person, but maybe because um, in the United States, but also across the world, the questions of migration, just as here in South Africa, are quite uh, topical right now, um, and they, they they 
absolutely, at least in my head, demand decolonial interventions. Um, and, and I see that we have, you know, because of the questions and the comments we're getting uh, going in that direction. But I want to, to pause a little bit and say, please, could we uh, have questions to Melissa, to Johanna, um, particularly with regards to the connections between their papers and especially around violence. Um, um, from my side, quickly, uh, a couple of things that I, I, I see could be surfaced in these discussions. In the first presentation by um, Lisa and Erica and Devon and Rachel on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, and I would like to pose a, a, a comment and, and hear your comment, Melissa, around this. The mention was, men, was made of living in fear. Um, and I'm struck by the similarities with the conditions of black women in this country, but also in other countries. Um, so both black women in South Africa and, and women of, of, as you say, in the United States, women of color. Um, and so there's something to be remarked about this, about um, the constancy of violence against black women's bodies, against black women. And I'd like to hear you comment about the, the, the this commonalities and um, which which are evident in the presentation in the paper you mentioned, um, and how one might make the, the connections. Um, the connection between your paper and Johanna's paper um, about, so Johanna is talking about um, a different kind of violence, but violence nonetheless. Um, she mentioned, um, well, the question, I have a couple of questions as well, but that, that the hair experience, if you will, can ruin your whole day, but it's not just a day, it's an assault really, as you said, you are on your whole existence. Um, and so the, the violence that is material, that is murder, also missing women mentioned in the first paper uh, here is manifested as non-material violence, but as violent because it can ruin your whole um, experience of just everyday experience of, of living as a black woman. Um, and we have had a, a number of, of questions to Anjali already about uh, um, and how the response in the work that they have been doing on decolonial psychology is involving resisting and making apparent this uh, the colonial violence uh, in in the area in which she she works. So there's a connection around violence in these papers. That's why I guess we we're putting them together. And I'd like you to pull out these connections, if you will, uh, all of you, if you, you about the symbolic, uh, about refugee experiences, about the material uh, violence as a material um, as a material phenomenon. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that we we didn't lift up quite uh, wasn't as clear, and maybe this is our last comment so that I don't speak too long, is the question of land, of occupation. Um, um, it's, it's not as clear, but in, in the introduction to this first installment, we speak about this kind of occupation um, and probably I don't know, um, maybe Melissa in particular, about the land occupation. I live in, a, in an ex-colony, in a settler colonial country, and, and some people would say the same about the United States, but also Canada um, and other parts of, of the world. Um, so land is a very important thing about who owns the land, because land is connected to a sec second uh, colonial occupation, which is the occupation of being. <clears throat> And we we um, we we think um, 
decolonial work should be all, you know focusing both on, on the occupation of, of being inland. But I'm wondering whether you have thoughts about that in particular, the occupation of being, because I can see it without going into too much detail here about how there's the kinds of violence. I spoke about symbolic, but also epistemic violence in uh, think in psychology, thinking about violence. So these are my comments to you. If you want to pick up, I would be happy, but if other people want to ask questions, um, I'm also happy. And I'm inviting again, once again, um, we're doing this in a decolonial way. Glenn Adams, get the ready, Shana Sapla, if you want to come in, please. I mean, I'll just jump in really quick, but the acts of, of violence are all tools of colonization, right? They're used for that power and for that control. Um, historically, current day, the fear, right? The fear to, to speak out, the, the fear to exist. These are all tools of colonization that, that continue. Um, to keep things uh, uneven, really. So I think there is a connection to, to all, of, all of the things sort of shared today and thinking about why it exists and, and how it, it is allowed to still exist in the way that it is. Thank you. Um, Johan, you wanna come in? Yeah, no? yes, I'm happy to, thank you. Um, come on, you raised some really, Good questions. I think, first of all, I want to say that obviously I think it, it's really difficult to compare what um, Melissa and Erica were talking about um, to the research that I was doing. But I think two things that came to mind um, when you were talking about the, the violence against um, women's bodies and Black women's and Indigenous women's bodies in particular um, were two things that I have not talked about yet. Um, here, but is all, which are also not really touched about in this paper, but we talk about in some of the other papers that I've published. Um, so one is the this idea of like violence against your own body. So if we think about, um, and I think some of the women that I talked to actually also address this, um, how how much pain and actually like physical wounds um, they would experience from, for example, chemically straightening their hair. Um, so there's actually a very popular um, movie by Chris Rock um, where he where he shows how dangerous um, those chemicals are and what happens to a chicken if you apply um, those chemicals. Um, but these women apply them to their hair um, and oftentimes they love, suffer from, from wounds from um, yeah just um, scraps on their on their head. head. Um, and so I think in in many ways there's a way of thinking about how those dominant standards of beauty um invite or to some same extent force black women to to um become violent against their own bodies um and then the other one is obviously this idea of like violence by others against black women's bodies and i guess some, in some ways this again goes back to the hairdressers because some people were talking about how going to the hairdresser is both like a process that you look forward to because you come out transformed you're, you're like seen as beautiful or acceptable now by dominant standards but at the same time, it's a very violent process because, again, the hairdresser might do something to do, do cause your pain. So whether it's chemically straightening your hair or getting a weave or braids, oftentimes you will have a couple of days of severe discomfort, um, if not actual physical pain that you take painkillers for. Um, and so, again, there's this, this kind of like violence um, that, that you experience on, on your own, on your body. Um, so those were two of the things that I thought about. And then just because I've been seeing the questions, I wanted to say that um, please feel free to, to email me um, later on or to, to message me on Twitter um, if I did not respond to your question right now here. Um, I'm always happy to have a conversation outside of this webinar. So yeah, please feel free to, to look me up and, and send me a message. Always happy to connect with people. I'm going to jump in. Um, we have 10 minutes left of this session and there are so many excellent questions. I think I'd like to direct um, this question about methods to everyone on the panel. Um, so we have a few questions on, on this. Um, one is such an excellent panel. Could you speak to how you see your decolonized methods of gathering knowledge 
uh, affecting the actual knowledge and information you have gained um, by uh, from Jill Brown. Uh, we have another question um, about how uh, your positions um, when you are gathering this information, how it's deeply personal and violent, and how do you do um, collect this information or study um, assault against Indigenous women without breaking down or spiraling in rage? Um, and a question to Johanna as well is about push back to your approach and methodology in research. So I think all of these questions are around how do we do decolonizing of, our, of mainstream methods or mainstream psychological methods um, when we are also experiencing these harms and these pains um, of these communities that we are engaging uh, with. Um, Melissa, Erica, would you like to perhaps start and then we can? Yeah, so I think one, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on the like, how do you not become like so angry and, and that it just sort of inhibits you from, from continuing to do this work. Um, and we do a lot of focus on sort of our holistic wellness as well um, within our lab and, and attending to those things. But I think for me, having a lived experience with this violence, it, it pushes me. I see that I have the privilege, right? I'm in a space. I have the degree. I get a voice that other people don't get. And I have this privilege. Um, and for me, I think that that allows me to sort of um, keep going. But I think we definitely, there are times where you sort of have to say, I, like I can't, I don't have the the emotional reserves to sort of do this thing today or, um, so we're very thoughtful about those those things and it's really needed. And I think too, it depends on sort of where you're at in your journey, right? Cause I think initially, um, I think that there was a long time that I was sort of very angry um, and I have moved into a place of compassion and healing and really focusing on those aspects um, for, for the women who've experienced the violence, but also for ourselves and thinking about healing our, our communities as well. That's what helps me personally sort of um, keep going. Thank you, Melissa. Johanna, Anjali, would you like to, to jump in? I'm happy to. Um, I, similarly, I think it can't, like, there's no question it's unbelievably enraging. And this research started during a time when the US was having, had um, a number of refugee bans imposed and a number of people on our team had family members who, should have been like who who were vetted through a process that is already unjust, but it, but they were supposed to be able to be reunited with their families in the U.S. and a ban was put in place that prevented it. And you see the heartbreak like sitting across the table from you, and and to know that it is so enraging. And it also, you know, I we would talk about like what kind of changes. Because part of this was an action project too. So we talk about like, well, what do people want to have happen? And a big thing was they didn't want like they wanted. US policy to change. And I kind of knew that as a team, we weren't going to be able to change national policy. Um, and it just, you feel really immobilized. And yet simultaneously, it's because you're wor I'm working with people who are right there with me. I mean, my own family's migration story, like my father was an immigrant um, and, uh, but not a refugee. And my great grandparents were immigrants who were came to the U.S. and became coal miners and I never got to know them and there's ways that I could think about like how some of this research gives me insight into the realities that generations of my family might have experienced that 
I wouldn't get to know about. So there's something really fulfilling about that. But the other piece too is like I become friends with people, I get to know people, and it becomes so real that I can't I can't be <laughs> immobilized. I have to do something because even yesterday when I was working and putting together the slides for this talk, I was sitting across a, from a friend who is here um, enrolled as a student, not because they want to be a student necessarily, but rather because it's a way to um, be able to be in this country and that when they don't want to be, I'm not going to go into the details of their story, but I, I could be working on this and see the intellectual side that I was going to be talking about today. But sitting right across from me was a friend who like these stories affect their every second of their life. And so that those connections make it so that I feel like however dis demobilized I feel, I don't have, I, I, I don't have the opportunity to explore that because of the privilege I have. I have to use it for what I'm passionate about. Thank you, Anjali. I think that um, after Johanna, a question about the methods was addressed to Melissa and, and Erica. Um, if you would uh, answer the question after this, that would be great. Um, Johanna, please. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, first of all, I think um, doing interviews and then also the kind of like more ethnographic parts were, was really empowering in many ways. And, and similar to Anjali, really allowed me to connect with a lot of people. And for some people, I'm still in, in touch to this very day. And I think, yeah, there's friendships that you form, form out of doing this kind of research. Um, I also think it was it was a very much like a methodology that, that allows for empathy um, and, and kind of like, yeah, for a very deep connection, which I think you need to do this kind of research and to open up about some of those traumatic and like violent experiences that can come with um, black hair care. Um, and then I also wanted to say that um, to the question of pushback, first of all, I'm really sorry that, that you're experiencing that kind of pushback. Um, I have to say that I was very fortunate. So I had a lot of support. Um, I wasn't fully clear like who that pushback is coming from. So is it from the from your research community or the, the people around you at your institute, or is it from the research participants? Um, in some ways I can I can imagine both. Um, so I want to say that one thing I noticed is I, I used to do my PhD research um, in the UK and in England, but I was at the University of Cambridge and in, in England, social psychology is very open to qualitative methods and methodologies. Um, so I was very much supported in, in doing this kind of research. Whereas in Germany, social psychology is much more heavily focused on quantitative methods. So since moving to the Max Planck Institute, um, when I speak to social psychologists here, I often have to do a lot more explaining in terms of like, what can your research actually like show? And like, did you follow up with it in like more quantitative ways, which I think is very interesting and, and challenging in some ways. Um, so, so I understand this, but at the same time, I want to say I, I moved to the Max Planck Institute for the study of religious and ethnic diversity. So actually a lot of my colleagues are political scientists, anthropologists, sociologists, who again use much more like different methodologies, a lot of ethnographic research. So again, I feel very supported. And I think in some ways it's about like bridging disciplines, I want to say, and like being open to this like multidisciplinarity and maybe not being so attached to to your own discipline, but then you can create kind of like a community around yourself where you feel that people understand the kind of research you want to do and, and are open for the kind of like methodological and also ethical conversations that are necessary to do this kind of research. Thanks, Joanna. We are at 29 minutes after seven, so we, we will have to stop uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, so I want to, to thank, thank you all. There are the the chat is is a buzz and people are asking questions and some some and we are leaving uh, some questions unanswered and some comments are, are really great. There's one about textualism, um, and there's one about the pedagogy for uh, the oppressed and of the oppressed again, uh, deserving uh, interaction with. So I want to thank you all and the uh, 75 of us in this in this uh, in this webinar. Uh, we started about 134. Uh, there. So thank you all. Uh, appreciate the, the panelists and, and my comrades and fellow travelers. I'm going to give this last minute uh, to Specie, to Sarah, to say uh, her peace. And so I bid you farewell and see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. I want to remind you that 
Our webinars will be on our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash spissy. We will be announcing the rest of our webinar series through email blasts and also on Twitter and Facebook. Our webinar series will run through the fall all throughout uh, through December. And all of these papers are open access online, the Journal of Social Issues. So check it out on Wiley's website. And thank you for joining us today. So uh, have a great rest of the day. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thanks, everyone.